Coming up, we sit down with former Westfield police captain and current mayor-elect Mike McCabe. We'll ask him a bit about his plan for the city and his connection to Westfield State University. The Mike Lasasa Show starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Lasasa and today I'm so honored to welcome to the stage recently elected mayor of Westfield, Mike McCabe. Thank you. Thanks Thank you so me. much for coming on the show. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. And um, yeah, let's just get right into it. So um, I'm curious, you ran in 2019 and it was a really close race. Yes. And I'm curious, what was the biggest factor that made you decide to run again? And was it a difficult decision to want to run again? It wasn't really a, a difficult decision to run again. The biggest factor was um, COVID response, believe it or not. Um, and the need to or the belief that I could provide a different type of leadership than what was being provided. Um, and I'm, again, I, this isn't an attack of any of the former folks that were there. It's just that um, there seems to have been a, um, uh, we'll say an overall lack of energy in key areas of the city that I think that maybe I can bring something to the table to to help embolden those initiatives moving forward. Yeah, that's good to know. And um, I imagine the impact of COVID-19 on Westfield was um, really harsh to deal with. Um, can't even imagine how that started. And what have you done in terms of um, preparing for the, the next steps of COVID. If COVID plans to get worse, do you have any plan of action that you might want to possibly take or? So it's interesting because the reason why I was late um, for this interview, that, you know, I just tell everybody in the world that I was a little bit late <laughs> because I was, I'd been on the phone um, already with um, the superintendent of schools, the health director and the president of the college actually trying to work towards an initiative to help the city of Westfield um, respond uh, in an area where some of our own ability has been withdrawn from the state. Um, so the conversation really has to do with either internships or actually three credit course programs in, um, in public health on really contact tracing and how that impacts um, future uh, visions of how we should move forward in terms of uh, battling the epidemic. Omicron is obviously a problem. Um, our rates in Westfield continue to go up. We have one of the lowest rates of vaccination in, in the state at 54%. Um, I hope that um, maybe by doing some work with media, and you know that I could do some social media stuff, um, work with social media and uh, di the di digital platforms and our own arm through uh, city governance, that we can encourage people to um, be more vaccinated. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a mandate guy, but um, when we talk to people about uh, vaccination and masks and we look at really who we see as images of the people that are best able to um, guide us forward, um, we all become our Google warriors, I guess, right? Um, but I look to Mark Kerouac and Andy Hartenstein and uh, Dr. Stremko and Dr. Sutton and every one of them to a person, you know, every single person I talk to in the medical field say, vaccinate and wear your masks when you're in social distance that, that requires that you, that you really should. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. And that's really good to know. And that does bring me to my next question. What do you hope to accomplish uh, as mayor? And what are you most excited about getting done as the mayor? So th th there are a bunch of things. Um, this, the scope of the job, when you kind of realize that all of a sudden you're front and center as the CEP, CEO of a, of a corporation, it's about $135 million. And the, um, the only thing that's really asked of, of that corporation is how do you provide service is to really see if we can do a better job in our service lines. So one of the ways that you do that is you um, provide a better foundation in terms of um, developing your boards and commissions that are that are out there already. Um, so when you look across the spectrum of your boards and commissions and you realize that there are 26 of them of various different appointing abilities, some are appointed by the mayor, some are appointed by city council, some are, are self-appointed. 
um, when, it, when you look at them across the board and you realize that there are people that are either in, in vacancy status, or there's nobody there, or in holdover status um, because they haven't been reappointed, um, it, it, be, it becomes a primary focus for me. So I will use my, there are two administrative functions in the office. One is a full-time function, one is a part-time function. I'll use the part-time function specifically to work on um, developing 100% capacity in those boards and commissions, and then also tangentially to use that person as a, um, as a research person. So there are a couple of things that, you know, there are boards and commissions are right in front of us, but there's ARPA that's also right in front of us, and there's budgeting that is right in front of us. I, w I, I could be probably one of the very few mayors ever to inherit a, um, a healthy economic picture. Um, usually it's been kind of the other way around where you're really looking to, um, you know, tighten the belt strings. And I'm not saying to be frivolous with money, I'm just saying, I'm in an economic situation where I would like to offer, um, instead of we can't do that because we don't have any money, to say, well, if we have X number of dollars in free cash, there's reasons why we have X number of dollars in free cash, and we should be actually using that money in free cash in FY22 rather than put it off to FY23. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, these things, to, to that function. So am I. And yeah, those do sound really promising. And I have no doubt that um, you'll be able to get there with, um, with all those plans. And that actually does bring me to um, my next question for you, which is, um, what has prepared you the most for taking on the role as mayor? You were a former police officer for a long time here in the city of Westfield. And I'm curious, did policing play any role in terms of getting you ready for being the mayor? Or what prepared you the most for being the mayor? I almost want to say, and not arrogantly, that my entire life history has kind of prepared me for this, this particular leadership role. So let's go back to Westfield Spates for a second, or even Westfield High before that. I was the liaison to the school committee at Westfield High School while I was in student government. When I went to Westfield State, I was a criminal justice major, but I was also the vice president of um, Westfield State University um, Student Senate. I was the apartment complex president at the same time I was a community council president, which is a weird dichotomy, but these things are true. So it's where I learned governance before I even got into policing. So Robert's Rules of Order is familiar to me and, and what the parlance of, of government actually was. So Westfield State was a major portion. Then we went into um, policing and by the time I was done with my policing career. I was in an executive leadership position. So for the last 20 years of my policing career, whether or not it was as a lieutenant or as a, a, um, a captain, I was in one of those weird lieutenant spots that was a detective lieutenant. So I, it was like a value added lieutenants and I'm not being disrespectful to any of the other lieutenants, but you were on a 24 hour a day, seven day a week rotation, which I had been on since 1989. Um, I was a detective, then I was in community policing as its first sergeant, and then I was um, as a detective lieutenant. All of those are 24 hour a day, seven day a week issues. So um, by the time I get to the mayor's role, I'm actually comfortable with executive leadership and problem solving and the rigors of having to answer the phone all the time. So. Oh, I imagine. Did you ever sleep at all uh, throughout all those? Um... I did, but I liked it. You know. Um, as a hobby, I'm a marathon runner. So you can imagine that um, if you don't know what that's about, it's about dedication, it's about training, it's about getting your miles in, it's about trying to figure out how to best schedule your time to get the most impact in your day. So, you know, I'm pretty familiar with how that works and um, I'm reasonably comfortable with it. And that's, that's really good to know. And since you did bring up Westfield State, um, your time here as a student, I am curious, um, what would you say to um, students right now who are thinking of going into public service? Um, but specifically, like, what would you say to yourself if you could say something and to the students here on campus? So my side, I also teach here. So I've been a professor here, adjunct faculty for 21 years. So um, I'm kind of uniquely in a position where I get to talk to students a lot. Um, and I specifically talked to them about um, policing. Um, 
So long as your role in policing is always to provide the best public service you can provide as an individual, then I think the rest of it will take care of itself. You know, if you're never, um, if you're never off script, if you always constantly stay that, you know, your job is to provide for public service and m ensure health and safety, if that is always your mantra, the, the rest of it will, will take care of itself. You know, we, we've gone through the defund policing thing. We realize kind of um, that defunding police is, is a catch-22 situation because when you defund police, you don't help those populations that are most needed to have help. You know, if you eviscerate the 24 hour a day, seven day a week social worker who is the only one that responds to your call because of some notion that maybe other people can do it better, well, you know, that's problematic. So I would say stay true to yourself, really believe in what you're doing is, is proper, and, you know, remember that your number one goal in policing is, believe it or not, social service. It's no mystery that criminal justice is a social service subset of, of sociology. So, you know, that's what I would tell people. That's a really great message, really positive message, too. And since you were talking about um, the issues that uh, we that the country has had with policing, defund the police, et cetera, what's your thoughts on um, the current political divide we have in our country? And have you had to face it at all throughout your time running uh, on the campaign trail for mayor? Sure. Um, how's uh, that been for you, and have you been able to overcome it? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think I faced it a lot more in 2019 than I did in 2021 because I retired. So. By the time that I ran the second time, I was no longer a police officer. But um, I think that, you know, Westfield doesn't, didn't face the same issues that maybe some of the urban communities did. Um, I think that there is a, a focus, which is a political focus, not necessarily a... Um, a reality-based focus. Yes, there was harm that's been done to, to, to people of color, for sure. But when you look at the, I shouldn't say but, I should say when you look at the statistics uh, across the board, you see that um, it's not exactly it, as it's portrayed, um, which is a political issue. It's not necessarily a factual issue. And again, if you circle back to if you remember while you're on the job that um, your job is to provide service to the greatest public health and good, then all the other stuff falls into play. I did an interview in 2019 with a woman um, from uh, Western Mass News, and it was on um, a Black Lives Matter um, protest, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, that was in Westfield. And um, the woman said to me, well, why aren't you going to go kneel with the protesters? And I said, because I have to remain neutral. There's no way for me to, to present myself any other way. And in policing, we are not allowed to speak publicly on what our beliefs are. So you hear one side of the story but you really don't hear the other side of the story. And when you're talking about constitutional parameters, when she was kind of taken back to that when I, when I said that I had to remain neutral. So that became the sound bite, rather than the understanding that there are other people who don't espouse the same beliefs as the Black Lives Matter people. So if they decide that they're gonna congregate on the side of the road, on the opposite side of the road, and now they see their police as taking a side, now you have this weird circumstance. So um, it's something that policing has always faced. You know, I see it as being cyclical. Um, you know, as a student of law enforcement and a student of policing and a student of civil rights, you know, people forget that there was the 1871 Civil Rights Act. They forget about the 1964 Civil Rights Act. They now see the 2021 Civil Rights Movement, if you will. These are cyclical things and things that we should learn from. Thank you for that. And I mean, it's it's such a tricky thing. And I mean, I, I've always thought of um, the whole issue with police. I, I wish there was more of a mutual understanding um, on both sides. I mean, I think there's there's evil in the world and it's and it's it's terrible. And um, it's 
it's going to take a long time for this issue to um, to finally, like you know, uh, make its way into history. But I think it's getting better every day, and I think as we continue to take steps towards improving law enforcement, uh, improving. Um, uh, everything else in the the whole justice system, I think, I think we're on our way there. And I think, I we think just the improvement comes with face to face interaction with people that are different than you. That's where the improvement comes in. Absolutely. So if I, you know, if I see somebody out on the street, it's that face to face quality interaction that creates the improvement. It isn't necessarily a lack of training. Do you think there's anybody out there training somebody to shoot somebody in the back and then plan evidence? Of course not. Do you think there's anybody out there telling somebody to lean on somebody's neck for nine minutes so the eventuality is there? Of course not. That's, it, you know, you, we're never going to be able to extract the human side of humans. And the thing is, what our country has faced lately in Democrat, Republican, police, like you name it, like nobody's willing to just sit down and talk, mm. you know? Like nobody can just sit down and have that conversation. Everybody's just so divided. Everybody's just so you know, at each other's necks. It's like whatever happened to just sitting down and talking it out reasonably, you know? So that's one thing that I'm going to face as a mayor. Um, and it, there's very clearly a divide between vaccin vaccinations and mask usage. There are some people that are polarized on one side and some people that are polarized on the other. And I think really you, the, the effort of government is supposed to be to provide those services that the individual cannot provide for themselves. That's really the essence of government. So when you look at it from a pragmatic standpoint and you talk, talk about vaccinations and you talk about masks, it's not about me. It's about whether or not I can give you a virus. And do I have a duty of care not to do that? That's what it's about. It's about wearing masks in places where um, there is close contact and you can get hit with droplets of, of saliva that may infect you. That's what it's about. So it's to me, it's about um, a caring for um, your, your fellow man rather than, you know, what's absolutely the best for me. Kind of thing. Absolutely. And um, that does bring me to um, one of our last questions, which is, like, who are your political heroes? Like, who do you look up to when you're trying to be neutral or in a tough situation with uh, voters? Like, you know, like, who do you look up to, if, if anyone? Or who do you kind of... Um... So internationally, I'll give you Churchill. Nationally, I'll give you Ronald Reagan. And locally, I'll give you somebody that... Um, I'm actually going to leave his name out of it. But he was masterful at being able to take a breath. So when things were very hot, when we make mistakes in life, our mistakes are usually made by a snap judgment that we quickly come to some sort of conclusion, not based on all the facts, but it's based on emotion. So this guy was a master at stepping back and saying to people, and not to offend. Let me get back to you on that. Let me let me take a look at that, but I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it right now. Now I'm adding in the I don't feel comfortable doing it right now because <laughs> it's kind of a 2021 thing, right? Um, but I don't feel comfortable right now. So if there's a knock on Mike McCabe, the knock on Mike McCabe is that he's quick to judgment. He's quick to um, put facts together and whatever calculus hits him in the brain, he, he'll come out with a, a, a pretty quick decision. If I've learned from any of my predecessors within the mayor's office specifically, and I've been around for a little while now, um, you do have to make judgment, but your judgment should be based on after taking a breath. So that, those are kind of folks that I, I look towards to, to say, you know, um, we can make decisions, but they don't have to be immediate split second decisions. You know, there's only very few, t like in law enforcement, there's only very few times in your entire police career where you really have to make a snap judgment. Most times you can consider your expertise, your experience, and your education all as the calculus before you actually come out with a decision. So, Thank you for that. And um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting to know. And I guess my last question for you is what made you want to go into politics um, after 
uh, your time in policing, um, did you just want to take the law in a different approach? Or what, what made you go? No, um, I decided to, to run because I, I honestly believe that I can provide some energy and some leadership in areas that people don't even think about. Um, you know, there are, I said 26 commissions, there's probably just as many departments that those commissions oversee. Um, you know, if you get into, into political theory and you talk about Maslow and you talk about, um, without boring everybody under the sun, but if you, if you talk about the, the principle of esteem, um, people really do need to know that they're valued their day-to-day -day, nine to five job has an impact on their community well beyond the scope of their nine to five job. And if you circle that back to service and you hear some of the stories that maybe aren't so positive, um, that I really do believe that we are supposed to, in government, provide service to people that, I'm not talking about being a doormat, but I'm talking about providing service to people that the person who wanted the service believed that they got good quality service. And I think that's really where, you know, where the rubber meets the road in government. Uh, too often times you hear things about, oh, well, we can't do that, or we can't do that, or we can't do that. And the actuality is, specifically in our time, believe it or not, in 2021 is, we can do it. It's finding the will to do it and the finances normally to do it. And right now we have the finances. So on January the 3rd, when um, during my inauguration comments, I'm gonna talk about departments that have been in a position where they haven't been able to do what they wanted to do because they didn't have the financial pieces there. Well, there's ways to do things without financial pieces, but I'm going to see if we can't provide them with the financial wherewithal to do those projects that they couldn't do by June 30th of 2022, before we even talk about the, the 2023 budget. That's a really good point. And um, thank you so much for sharing. And also, um, thank you so much for coming on the show today. After all the ads I saw on Hulu and HBO Max, uh, finally good to meet you in person. Um, Mayor McCabe, thank you so much for coming on the show today. That's all a credit to Kate McCabe. <laughs> Great to know. And thank you so much for watching uh, the first episode of the Mike Lasasa Show. We'll hope to be back soon. Thank you again. Catch you next time.